Welcome to Energy Enabling Development, one of two afternoon breakout sessions here at the 2020 Duke University Energy Conference. I'm Megan Klebanoff, a second year MBA and Master of Environmental Management joint degree candidate here at Duke. In this session, we will hear from industry experts on how they harness the power of energy to facilitate sustainable development in communities across the globe. As far as the format of this session goes, our moderator, Benjamin Atia, will introduce and kick off discussion with our panelists. We will reserve 15 minutes at the end of this session to respond to audience questions. Please use the Q&A function throughout the discussion to submit your questions as I'll be monitoring those as they come through. If you would like to live tweet during the session, we encourage you to use the hashtag DUEC20. I'd now like to introduce the moderator for today's panel, Benjamin Atia. Benjamin is a senior research analyst in the energy transition practice at Wood Mackenzie, a global consultancy providing data analytics, market research, and advisory services across the energy sector. A more detailed bio for Benjamin, along with each of today's panelists, can be found in the link I'll share in the chat. Thank you, Benjamin, for being here. Now I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Megan. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining. And welcome to the session on energy and sustainable development as part of Duke Energy Week. Um, as Megan said, my name is Benjamin Atiyah. I am a senior research analyst at Wood McKenzie in the energy transition practice. And I lead our coverage of global solar markets, particularly focused in Africa and the Middle East, as well as uh, focused on off-grid energy globally. Um, I'd now like to ask each of our panelists to turn on their cameras, um, and we'll go through some introductions for each of them before we dive into the questions. Cassandra, can we start with you? Um, so I'd like to just have each of you introduce yourself, your organization, um, and then briefly address two points, which is um, sort of how did you begin in this, this junction of energy and sustainable development, and what is your sort of area of coverage or which regions or communities do you most closely work with? Great. Uh, thank you uh, very much for inviting me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cassandra Naika. I'm a managing director at Denim Capital. Um, the areas in which I focus are purely renewables, and uh, the countries or regions that I focus on are Africa and South Southeast Asia. And at present, I'm involved in uh, some projects in Latin America as well. Great. Thanks, Ms. Sandra. Um, Erica, do you want to go next? Sure, thanks for having me. My name is Erica Mackey. Um, I am one of two co-founders at Grid Alternatives. And uh, we're a nonprofit based in the US um, with regional offices in uh, California, Colorado, Washington, DC. And uh, we work, we're builders, um, but sort of at the intersection of solar as a social justice tool. Um, and I also have a fairly substantial tribal program that works with um, tribal nations, mostly contained within the borders of the United States, um, but specifically in the Pacific Northwest, in the Great Plains area in the Southwest. And then we have some small uh, programs in Nepal, Nicaragua, and Mexico. Great, thanks, Erica. And Rotimi, do you wanna go next? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, Rotimi, it's almost here. Um, I am uh, located in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, and actually, uh, I, I did actually go to Duke University to uh, transform myself into an energy professional, to be quite honest, um, did the environmental management program and the MBA at the same time, and that kind of kicked off my journey to get to where I am now. I uh, worked for Siemens for about five years um, in a CFO training program. Um, so I got the chance to work on microgrids from um, um, uh, uh, Ecuador to the USA, Canada, uh, and eventually moved to Nigeria to work on uh, investing in gas to power projects from Nigeria to Ghana and across the region. Uh, I eventually left in 2018, end of the year, to really kind of get to the grassroots level of providing people better energy experiences uh, using renewables and other decentralized and digitalized uh, energy technologies um, at the uh, grassroots level. And that's what I'm doing now, happy to talk more. Awesome. Well, as you guys can all tell, we have a very star-studded panel today, so let's get right into it. Um, but before we dive into some specifics, I do sort of want to 
set the stage with a, an acknowledgement that energy and sustainable development is a very broad topic. Um, so in order to, to help us focus our conversation a little bit and draw some of the experiences of each of our panelists from um, their activities across the world, I do want to sort of challenge the three of you to collectively come up with uh, how we would define this space of energy and sustainable development. Let's put some fences around what we will be talking about today and, and what maybe falls out of scope just so that we can be a little bit more focused. Um, Jasandra, I'll actually start with you on this one as well. Um, but all of you, all three of you feel free to chip in and let's sort of crowdsource a definition before we move forward. Sure. So um, to me, uh, renewables is that intersection uh, between energy and sustainable development. And it, it's simply not just building another power generation facility that produces clean power, but it also needs to be a project or facility that results in long-term sustainable impact and through its development cycle, show how it works in tandem with, um, I'd call it collectively, the ESG principles or requirements. Uh, and in this regard, what I'm really referring to is the environmental, social and governance development aspects and the impact of that development process in ensuring that these goals are achieved in a sustainable manner, while at the same time generating a market-related return. For example, um, when we, uh, just by background, prior to joining Denim, I, I, I was the CEO of a company called Biotherm Energy, and we built out one of the largest renewable energy platforms across the African continent. And during that time, when we first built our first wind and solar projects in South Africa, we ensured that there was a very strong community impact element, given that these projects were built in very rural areas of the country where access for to many things were actually quite limited and access to tertiary education was a monetary challenge. So these projects, um, once they became operational, allocated a certain percentage of their revenues towards providing scholarships and internships. From a community impact perspective, we also ensured that funds were allocated towards rural development initiatives, healthcare, and early, early childhood development centers, knowing full well that if we did not invest in the community, these projects would not have the multiplier impact that they've had in terms of improving the community as a whole. We also ensure that there was a balance between the environmental risks um, that these projects came with and also the heritage related issues by ensuring that we did good by doing right. And that to me is what that intersection between energy and sustainable development is all about. I'll stop there. Sure. Erica, do you wanna build on that? Yeah, I love this sort of like a play on the word intersection, um, you know, in terms of our you mostly US based work, um, you know, I kind of think of like, how are we really building power and how to do that in a way that is people first community led um, and what what intersection for us in sort of a climate justice context means is that you know people don't really care so much about shiny blue panels or cool inverters or battery banks. Um, what they care about are real world um, issues that are like you know in a way issues of survival and thriving. Right. So things like the intersection between, you know, is energy also addressing systemic racism? And is it that we got here um, because of systemic racism in the US? Um, is it addressing systemic issues with housing, with um, energy, energy security, with, um, you know, energy sovereignty? And so, um, you know, using technology as a way to um, you know, put people and community first and listen to community and people in a sort of justice space. Um, that's what the way I think about intersection is that you know, everything must have a multiplier, everything must start with listening, everything um, must um, you know, not just be about access, but be about deep equity. <laughs> 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And yeah, it can, we can see the connections between having access to energy, whether it's you know, obviously, of course, clean energy, but just having access to energy in general um, and the connection to economic prosperity, connection to rights with land, rights with uh, you know, all of the things that you just mentioned, and systemic inequality um, is furthered uh, by inequal, inequal access to electricity and also inhibited by um, barriers that prevent um, access to clean electricity. Uh, Rasimi, uh, from your experience in Lagos um, working with Aspire, is there anything you'd like to add to that definition? Yeah, the way I look at it is um, I tend to think about it from a collaborative capitalism perspective. Um, I think that we tend to place a very high discount rate on the, the future, you know, the generations that are coming ahead on their welfare, to be quite honest with you. Um, and I think that, you know, how we got here is obviously that uh, countries that are way more developed um, have used up a lot more of the carbon budget than you know, uh, countries like where I am right now that are just struggling to kind of get off their feet. So I think uh, you know, one element of collaboration is also this thought process around uh, enabling developing countries to use up more of the available carbon budget that does exist while also supporting them to potentially even leapfrog um, into way cleaner, smarter um, solutions, but recognizing that it won't happen overnight. You've got to go through a process. And at the same time, developing countries accelerating their leapfrogging process of transitioning away because they're in like a negative carbon budget right now. And so that's the way that I look at it is, is, is having more of a lower discount rate on people's uh, welfare in the future. And I think once we do that, it will align our incentives properly. But that's the hardest thing to really achieve in all of this. Yeah, Can I add yeah, one thing I, really I like... love about what Rosemi said is that you could um, you could put people or individuals in a way into that context of countries, right? Like who's used up a carbon budget, um, you know, even within the U.S., um, you know, and I think that that then is like, well, who should be first in line? Who should be leading the charge? Who should be... Um, you know, most benefiting from the transition should be the reverse of who's used up the carbon credit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of issues or questions around energy equity, right? When we think about uh, additive renewable energy capacity, uh, like what Jasandra has been building in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and substitutionary renewable energy capacity in places like the U.S., uh, where we might be displacing dirtier fuels, pushing coal to earlier retirement, these types of things. Um, and, and just thinking about uh, what that looks like and how we can quantify that discount rate in those two very different situations by building the same technology at a roughly similar cost in most cases um, can be dramatically different, right? So I think we'll, we'll explore that a little bit more um, as we go on. But I think this is a good definition and a good way to sort of frame our conversation. Um, we're thinking a little bit more uh, or a little bit farther than pure commercial returns when we talk about sustainable development. Um, some of these things can be hard to quantify. Some of them can be, um, you know, maybe a little bit less uh, concrete in some ways, um, but they're no less real um, and things that we need to think about, particularly when we're talking about energy and emerging markets and thinking about um, sustainable development as a broad concept. Um, so I think this is helpful framing. Um, I do want to sort of think about this a little bit, though, uh, maybe at a little bit more of an academic level. Um, because this is a, an academic conference, um, one that I, these types of things I participate in a little bit less, but I get to geek out a little bit here. So if you'll humor me, um, you know, across the academic literature, we've seen that access to energy has long been called the golden thread of development. We've heard this from UN and World Bank reports and such for decades, um, connecting economic growth, social equity, environmental sustainability. Um, but actually a, a meta-analysis done by um, the Sustainable Energy Transitions Initiative at Duke um, did find some pretty clear blind spots in the literature um, on some of the areas where we might see uh, sustainable development benefits from access to energy and things like education, gender equity, public service quality, ag, et cetera. Um, so I'd love to hear some specific examples from each of you um, from your work in the field on ways where you see some of those intersections um, where you might be able to fill in some of those gaps that maybe academic literature hasn't quite covered. Um, Erica, maybe you'd be a good one to start off on that. I don't know that this is an academic response, but I think uh, sure, I could paint a picture. <laughs> I could paint a picture of uh, 
you know, where I think at Grid Alternatives, our work is most magical and most intersectional. Um, you know, so for instance, um, in California and in Washington, D.C., we have some substantial government um, programs that were put in place by policy and then went through sort of the regulatory um, machine to come out as programs. And the programs themselves are basically, you know, additional dollars incentivizing clean mobility, so EV chargers, solar panels, uh, storage um, in communities that are qualified as low income. So people have to be income qualified to um, participate in the programs and they then get these you know, additive incentives that pay for technology. Um, now you could run a program like that where you get the technology out there. You don't necessarily think about deep savings. You don't think about co-benefits or you could do what I think grid is doing particularly well, which is every installation is a on the job training opportunity for people in the same community where solar is going up every installation works to make sure all the economic benefits of those panels go into the hands of the end user, as opposed to let's trade one bill for another, but you have shiny blue panels that are good for the earth. Um, every installation makes sure that people have signed up for every other available program like energy efficiency in the home or storage or clean mobility or, or, or. Um, so thinking about the ways in which those co-benefits can all play into a single thing. So in the end, panels went up, which is what the government program was about. And they went up on people's rooftops that are generally in environmental justice communities and on the front lines of climate injustice. And it wasn't just about those panels going up. It was about what kind of power um, do people have um, in the experience of choosing panels for their home, getting trained for a growing clean workforce and getting other co-benefits as part of that panel. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Jasandra, Rotimi, feel free to chip in. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to uh, jump in here if Cassandra doesn't mind. Um, yeah, so this is something that's that's on my mind all the time. I uh, just, I wrote an article recently uh, titled um, "A Fully Inclusive Sustainable Development Goal 7. This is the one that is supposed to focus on uh, clean, modern access to energy for all. Right? The, there's an all. All is right at the the end there. In particular, in um, in places like Nigeria. Uh, what we see now in, in action, both in literature and also in execution, is that rightfully so, those in rural areas that have been forgotten you know, just since the beginning of time are rightfully now getting the help that they deserve. World Bank, Africa Development Bank, there's so many pro programs, Rural Electrification Agency in Nigeria has done a great job. Um, grid, the grid access space in itself, so grid power plants are just still a mess in the country right now. We'll get there one day, but it's going to take some time. And then you also see this big push with CNI, really good business opportunities, so lots of money is going in that direction. Something that's been left out of the narrative completely are those people in the middle income bracket of a lot of these countries. Um, they almost don't exist in the literature. So. If you're, for example, a school in an urban area where lots of middle income students go, we're working on one right now. They came to us because they know that they ran a very inefficient backup power system in their old school. Um, and what they asked us for, is there, is there a more sustainable way to deliver 24 seven access to this uh, school while also inspiring the next generation to think in this manner for the future? So by actually refocusing our attention, not just on those at the supposed you know, bottom of the pyramid and those at the top of that pyramid supposedly as well, but making it fully inclusive and also thinking about the engine of the economy that is the middle income group as well, we can also solve our climate challenge as well, while at the same time 
preparing the next generation um, of people that will be working on more sustainable um, solutions and living it out as well. So that's an example of something that we see happening aggressively here. We like more attention paid to all the, the segments that, that actually leverage uh, energy. Mm. Anything to so, add, Sandra? Sure. Um, so the way I, I would also like for us to, to think about it is, all, uh, is very much a function of energy regulation. And um, I look at Africa as a continent and I look at the various approaches that different African countries have taken towards clean energy and a sustainable impact that that clean energy could actually have. In some countries, it's become the norm that if you are putting up to your point Ad, uh, uh, additive energy, you also need to do X, Y, and Z. And that is part of the regulatory context in which we operate. Um, in other parts of the world where it, it's simply just put up a new facility. So, you know, get it done, this is the return, and, and that, that's so be it. Um, but what I've seen more so in emerging markets, which is where I actually operate, you are required as part as an owner of a particular asset to do a variety of other things. So you look at it from a perspective that if you if your asset is in, in, in a certain region, you actually have to do a lot from a rural perspective. However, if your asset from a CNI perspective, for example, is in a um, economic hub, you are, are less inclined to do to do something about it. However, in nine out of 10 countries in which we've operated, it can, uh, energy security becomes then the play card in order for you to decide what else can I do that is sustainable. And that then becomes the driver in terms of wanting to ensure that I'm cleaner, I'm, I'm doing more for the environment, et cetera. And, and to me, it's, it's those are the two drivers that actually bring into this market the ability to improve um, and also to, to replace uh, old energy with clean. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's something to what she said just now. Please, please. Yeah, I was just gonna say like, just tying everything she said together. So if you look at it as an entire system, um, from a systems thinking perspective, I think that's essentially what a lot of the literature is, is, is missing. Um, we tend to look at things in silos right now, whereas we can make our systems more resilient, cleaner, um, just like she was talking about. If we actually look at the interconnections between all these different stakeholders in the value chain that are using energy and need to use it more efficiently, quite, uh, quite frankly. So. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's something that kind of goes to some key differences between, say, Erica's work and your work, Rotimi, which is that, you know, your primary value proposition of distributed solar assets in Nigeria for the CNI sector is diesel displacement, right? So, A, that gives you, uh, you know, a very clear sort of ESG benefit um, to what you're doing. But B, it also gives you a huge amount of ceiling in terms of bill savings, right? Because some of those diesel costs can be ridiculously high. Um, and Erica might be facing some of those same issues with a different diesel price environment um, or as an alternative to the grid, right? Hence the name. Um, in which case, you know, that value proposition is fundamentally different. Um, and those ancillary non-commercial energy benefits are also fundamentally different. Um, and I think there's, there's some interesting comparisons that we might be able to draw um, by thinking about some of the ways that there are similarities and differences across um, you know, some of these ancillary benefits that each of you guys are, that the work that each of you are doing is, is providing. Um, so I'd love to just kind of maybe separate some of those and some of the ways that we see similarities across, say, Sub-Saharan Africa, and perhaps um, looking at, you know, for example, some of the tribal work that the grid, grid is doing here in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, maybe, uh, Rotimi, it'd be good to start with you on that one, too. Um, you might have a good perspective on both sides. Yeah, um, so I, I think just from a, a perspective, um, you know, like, I, I had a lot of experience with Siemens, for example, there was a project we worked on um, in Canada, the Algonquin microgrid project. And it's one of the first times I actually saw a, a university kind of looking at the concept of being able to support everything around it, uh, becoming a more resilient um, um, university and, and, and actually trading electricity and other um, energy sources with, with the grid. Um, and that really kind of got me thinking about my situation in this country where I, I kind of um, come from and why it's such a, you know, a challenge the way that it is. And so I, I thought, okay, let's try and get every home and every business um, 
a solar and backup storage solution, right? That, you know, the grid is kind of available in most of the urban areas. So if we can store enough and maybe substitute enough um, diesel, then things should be good, right? And I think in the process of going through that, um, and especially working with businesses and homes and now communities, we kind of realize that it's actually more of, about a network efficiency problem. And so where we are evolving ourselves to now is how to work with commercials and communities to become anchors in districts and communities so that we can eliminate the one house, one diesel generator or one business, one diesel generator concept and enable one generator and a solar system or a storage system to actually intelligently support everything that's around it for the four hours, six hours, or 12 hours that the grid is not available. And so that's where we are evolving ourselves uh, to, uh, you know, just kind of bifurcating everything. We started engaging with individuals, but we've actually realized it's just like the grid, but the virtual grid. And so that's where we're evolving um, the company into now. Yeah, something just really quick on that before we move on is, I think that a, there's a really interesting concept when you start thinking about a grid from the bottom up. Um, so if we think about what it looks like to have 100% captive supply and demand for all off takers on say a microgrid, right? Um, if we were to have everyone fully meeting 24 hour resiliency on their own on a fully captive basis, um, that CapEx and OpEx number is, is quite high. Um, but the valuation, the way to value the asset of those poles and wires um, that could connect those communities or those individual households, businesses, whatever, that are part of this, this grid network, um, the asset valuation of those poles and wires is not CapEx, it's CapEx savings on an, on a cumulative basis. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the way that we're looking at it. And, you know, the, the concept of the virtual power plant it's quite, you know, it's, it's aggressively taking off in you know, the U.S. and Germany is kind of like led the way here. We have the additional challenge that the grid itself is not a very efficient network. And so if we're thinking about putting charging stations at every Domino's in Nigeria or something of that nature, um, we still have to kind of take on a little bit of the work of the intelligence of the system that enables you that's next door to know that, hey, you don't need a generator, just buy the the power from, from next door, but you still need some of the, the ancillary cabling and stuff like that. It will work beside the grid. And so the grid has a role to play and we see a resilient kind of virtual grid that supports the grid so that it can develop over, over time. Right, and I think what it does to, uh, again, we're kind of going on a bit of a tangent here, but I think this is really interesting. Um, what it does also is it turns your poles and wires from an infra asset that make infra returns um, and are carrying an un unreliable, unstable, low quality power, particularly in, in Nigeria, um, right. t turns your poles and wires from that into something that can earn up to the headroom of exactly. that CapEx Delta, right? Um, which is a exactly. much higher return profile and a much higher value add to your customers. Um, exactly. And simple, simple grid balancing and synchronization can, do, can go a long way in some of those contexts. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. All right, where were we? Sorry, that, that's really interesting to me. I got a little, little distracted here. So thinking about some of those um, similarities and differences in ancillary benefits um, uh, across each of your work. Um, Jasandra, Erica, any, anything to add there? I think there's something interesting. I mean, first of all, I think where you have a stable grid, um, you know, the benefit is really people are talking about climate and economics. Um, as opposed to, I didn't have electricity and now I do have electricity, right? Which is a very different sort of shift um, from a lot of the, the access work. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, there is a tension between economies of scale in large, you know, there's a lot of talk about community solar and is community solar actually for the community or it's a big array that is um, providing a lot of power to a lot of subscribers, but not actually um, getting that economic benefit. Um, and so, you know, we do a lot of thinking about what are the policies that need to be put in place to make community solar 
really about the community as opposed to another word for a large array with lots of virtual subscribers. Um, and I think that, you know, that sort of difference around is the primary benefit for the end user when they think about, I now have access to solar economic or is it, um, I have access to electricity. Um, you know, the climate benefit is there in both instances. Um, but I think there's, there's something in that context. And I think the other like really big systems that we think about are housing um, and job access to jobs. So I think there is a lot of like the built infrastructure and the like massive move, um, you know, to a, a more clean, um, you know, future in the U.S. powered by renewables with, you know, cities and states having 100% renewable um, goals on the books. Um, but I think that's not just about where the projects are cited, if you want to think about justice and environmental justice. It's really about, you know, who's building those projects, who's having career mobility as part of that, you know, building of that infrastructure. Yeah, and Jasandra, for you, right? I mean, there's there's a bit of a difference between the way that, that Erica and Rotimi are looking at customer-facing business. Um, mm -hmm. Biotherm, of course, now owned by Actis, is selling it has PPAs with utilities, right? Um, so your customer is a utility um, that is then serving, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of uh, its rate base, right? Um, mm -hmm. So thinking about, yes, there are some ancillary benefits during the construction and development phase of that project, you know, thinking about black economic empowerment in South Africa, some of the things that you've touched on before. Um, but I think there's a bit of a different dynamic in the utility scale sector. Um, we're talking about deploying renewables because um, you have a different customer with different incentives um, and different constraints, right? Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about ESCOM's constraints as an example, um, there's a massive amount of broader sustainable development impact that is both encouraged by incre you know, greening uh, ESCOM's grid and, and sort of reducing the load shedding uh, risk essentially. Um, and then also you know, the broader electricity access benefits that um, come from stable and hopefully less cost inflationary power from ESCOM in the future, right? Um, so yeah, I'd just be curious to think, you know, you've, you've been in the utility scale space for a, a little while now. Um, I'd just be curious to think about some of the ways that you've seen that shift um, play out over the last decade or however long it's been. <laughs> so um, just to clarify one point, prior to the exit of Denim Capital in Biotherm, um, Biotherm did focus on the larger side of the CNI market. And that's in particular having mining companies, for example, as off takers, okay. where we were yep. providing or building out large scale solar projects for within the fence activities. Um, and the reason why that was a big market opportunity, uh, and we called it the corporate PPA market, is because of the fact that we had such poor energy security in country. Uh, and it was not just in South Africa, but across multiple African countries where we felt this as an opportunity. Um, in terms of selling directly to um, your uh, PPA as to your utility, um, essentially what happens in, in, in that instance is we uh, contract with ESCOM, we win through an auction, and we essentially, as part of the, the project that we're developing, we're also investing a fair amount of our, our project spend into upgrading the grid infrastructure. Because nine out of 10 times, the reason in order for us to be able to deliver our power, we need that particular part of the grid to actually be enhanced. So what a, uh, especially where there is a single state utility, what they've often done is requested that we do the upgrade as part of our project cross and then hand over to them. So indirectly a state utility is essentially getting these upgrades through the private sector, but without it being fully known that it is a private sector investment into a state utility upgrade. And um, you know, to me, that has been one of the um, perhaps uh, benefits 
that have come as a, for ESCOM who is you know, financially constrained in terms of it. And in fact, the private sector needs these connection points and, and, and needs the upgrade from a transmission perspective and uh, also want to sell their power. So they end up doing a fair, a fair much uh, more. So you know, when um, the renewable sector in South Africa in particular came under quite significant scrutiny, you know, many of these arguments were never made as to, well, what are the added benefits of the renewable energy program in country? And it is a pity that it wasn't because in many facets, both from a social perspective, as I've mentioned at the start of this, as well as from a you know, utility perspective, private sectors actually come in and made that investment. Right, and to do it without a separate tender or a separate procurement is additionally beneficial. And when yeah. the utility is your customer, um, on you know, with the REAP program, uh, it's, it is sort of, you know, maybe to borrow a phrase that's not very applicable, um, that rising tide does lift all boats, right? Um, exactly. The benefits, you, you, if your off-taker uh, bankability improves um, as part of, you know, get as a result of your grid in for upgrades, um, this is beneficial to Biotherm, it's beneficial to ESCOM, and it's beneficial to ESCOM's cu customers, which is then reversely beneficial to ESCOM, which is then reversely beneficial to Biotherm. Um, yeah. So there's a virtuous cycle there of having reliable grid, uh, Rotimi might might feel differently in Nigeria, right? Where of course there's a massive, massive, massive disparity in Nigeria on the grid, where there's less than 12 gigawatts of operational or of installed capacity, about 3.6 oh, yeah. gigawatts or so of installed operational capacity on the grid, 189 million people, um, <laughs> and then something oh, in the neighborhood of 40 to 60 gigawatts of distributed diesel I'm in the country. Um, yeah. yeah, your your value prop your value prop is uh, a little bit more competitive. Um, with the discounts right. in Nigeria, um, but really you compete with diesel. You really almost don't compete with the grid at all. Um, so while that, that sort of complementary benefit in the utility scale segment might bring some of those commercial benefits and those ancillary benefits, um, that's, that's maybe less true for Aspire. Would you agree with that? So, I mean, that was my entire business case at the, you know, few years ago. Um, and I think the, the, the details kind of reveal something a little bit more telling, right? So if you, if you look at, um, an, at Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you'll find that Nigeria actually has one of the lowest diesel prices you know, anywhere in, in the country, potentially in the world, you know, like uh, even though we, we import our, uh, our products back in, it's pretty low. And so, and there are no incentives. And, and subsidized <laughs> and so, up until yeah. recently. Exactly right, and there's no incentives, um, nothing of that nature. So you you have a re very standalone case. Now, when diesel kind of goes up to about 400 naira per liter, so it crosses essentially that dollar threshold, I think everything becomes you know extremely viable. Um, but I think right now, what you see is you really need this long-term business case to convince commercials that um, this will work. And if you're dealing with a pharmaceutical and industrial customer, they get it right away. If they can save 10, 20% per year, they'll do it. A lot of them are doing it. That's why it's a very viable space for C&I. Um, however, when you move away from all of the industrials, we realize that actually, in addition to the industrials, all of, uh, a lot of Nigerians live in gated communities. And so these entities, although they don't have the same load curve, right, you know, using energy mostly during the day, they have the duck curve. There are uh, hundreds of thousands of people on an annual basis that are kind of, you know, organizing themselves into community and they behave like commercials in a certain way. And so they are extremely like frugal when it comes to the, the cost that they pay for electricity. What is working well in Nigeria now is the grid just increased uh, prices of grid electricity by more than 100%. And so what you have now is grid um, electricity and diesel prices, excluding the capex of the diesel, are almost at grid parity, right? And solar, depending on your cost of capital, right? If you have 19% lending, then you're out, right? If you have, you know, someone like Cross Boundary or someone else, 10% uh, capital or even lower, solar essentially just trumps everything else if you're doing it without the storage. And so that's why it's very compelling for CNI, but it's also going to become equally as compelling for everyone else within the decentralized ecosystem as well. The diesel prices are a problem though. It's, it's quite low. Um, the, the other thing I just leave you with very quickly is when these um, electrical engineers and designers develop uh, solutions for industrials, commercials, communities, uh, 
they tend to oversize massively the diesel generator. So we saw a community where 37 apartments, luxury apartments, they were, you know, between middle income to luxury, um, they had two megawatts of backup diesel generation capacity for 37 apartments. That's about 50 kVA of capacity per home. It's absolutely absurd. They needed something like, you know, 350. And so we are all also seeing a room in the market for an automated design system. We have a lot of that data and we're starting to work on that now. That right sizes both energy storage, diesel generation, which already eliminates a ton of emissions. If you can go down from two megawatts to 500, you've just cut out a significant amount of emissions. And in the same vein, reduce costs just by designing things with better data analytics. So there's a lot of ways to tackle and, and achieve the same result ultimately. Right, and there's something to be said too about price certainty as well, right? Which is, you know, if you have fluctuating diesel prices, um, even with recently repealed subsidy, um, the, the diesel price in Nigeria has risen something like 40 or 45% over the last five years. Um, not in a straight line, uh, but on net across most of the states, right? So if you're looking at uh, forecasting for CNI customers, um, for them to understand their energy costs in the future, um, this is an unpredictable element. So if you can reduce it from 100% of generation, mostly oversized, to something right. like maybe 20 or 25% of generation, um, that fluctuation right. matters a lot less. Um, wow. And that's huge. And that's true. And that's true for, I know we're sort of focusing on Nigeria a little bit here, but that's true in, um, you know, when it comes to understanding future costs for the grid, um, for Erica and her customers. And it's true, especially in Southern Africa, right? When it comes to inflationary grid prices, um, particularly in, in, in South Africa with ESCOM, um, CNI customers or, or utility offtake um, wanting to understand um, what it looks like to uh, have a fixed price of power um, for the life of a PPA um, has an ancillary benefit in, it to, in and of its own right too. Um, which is something to think about. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I do want to sort of shift gears a little bit here um, and kind of return to that initial question that we had around energy equity. Um, so low and middle income customers um, or middle income customers in low income countries um, in which all three of you are, are operating or dealing with um, typically bear much less responsibility, little to no responsibility um, for climate change when it comes to that carbon budget. Um, and they're also, in most cases, likely to face disproportionate impacts from climate change in the future. Um, so I'd love to just kind of talk about that from each of your three unique perspectives um, in that space, um, to think about that in terms of carbon budget, um, in terms of maybe diesel displacement for some of you, or additive or substitutionary power, um, maybe for Jasandra, um, and then to think about um, how some of those climate change impacts uh, might impact your customers, and what are some ways that you guys sort of respond to that. Um, or some of the ways that your business um, or your, your organizations have um, sort of accounted for that in your work. Because I think that's a really key issue when it comes to thinking about sustainable development. Part of that is equity, right? Um, and that's something that can be hard to quantify or hard to sort of enforce in some ways. Um, but there's a massive disparity uh, when it comes to uh, previous responsibility and future responsibility um, and what that looks like in terms of, of uh, benefits and costs, essentially. Uh, anyone care to start? That's, a, that's an open question. I'd love to hear Erica, you uh, got something to say? <laughs> yeah, you look like you got something to say there. Uh, well, I was thinking about a couple of things. One, um, you know, for us, it's really about first in line, most to benefit, um, and thinking about how do you put financial teeth. Harm has been done, harm is continuing to be done. And how do we, um, with a framework of, you know, who is paying the cost, then, um, you know, provide the most benefit. Um, but there was something, you know, I listened to the conversation about grid, um, uh, you know, in other countries. And there was something that Jasandra said that was made me think a little bit like we don't have, you know, the private sector helping out with, you know, state owned utility. Our utilities are mostly um, private in and of themselves, also somewhat regulated, depending on where you are. But um, for so long, the dynamic was that distributed generation is taking away customers 
from utility. And now we're looking at a you know, time where we have you know, massive wildfires and our utilities are shutting down power for days on end saying, I'm sorry, we don't wanna cause that fire. We don't want our transmission to start a forest fire in your neighborhood. So therefore you won't have power for the next five days. Um, and that's then a massive um, issue for folks who have a refrigerator that hard earned money went to stocking and that all that food, if you have to replace that without any kind of backup power is a massive economic challenge. Um, and, you know, it can even be the, you know, life and death if you need to, you know, have health equipment that plugs into the wall and you don't have um, energy. And so now there's been, you know, sort of a shift with utilities and, you um, distributed generation that like, oh, well now let's, you know, make sure that everybody has storage and everybody has solar plus storage because it's going to help us out so much because now we're going to lose customers or we're going to enrage customers because we're closing them off. Um, and I think then to go back to your question around equity, it's like, well, who is actually that harming the most? And how do we put those folks at the front of the line and listen most to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, those are some great points. Um, I'll, I'll just add to that. Uh, look, you know, if I, I you know, I'm talking about things from a Nigerian perspective, um, I think also in South Africa, it's way more developed uh, from like just an urbanization perspective and country perspective. But you know, uh, you also have the blackouts there, right? Um, and it, and, it, and it can happen anytime. I think we kind of need to come to terms with the fact that yes, the uh, the uh, grid scale model has kind of, yes, it's, it's enabled development around the world, but we are, we are in different times. Uh, populations are expanding very fast, right? The amount of capital, especially in, in Africa, since we were so kind of far behind from a development perspective, required to build transmission lines, north to south, east to west, all that kind of stuff. If you look at it, it just, you know, where these decentralized technologies are from a cost profile today, it just makes good business sense, makes good economic development, uh, socioeconomic development sense to try and make these communities more resilient. So the person that's selling in their restaurant or that's operating their facility doesn't have to listen to what Erica just said whether it's in California or whether it's in Lagos, Nigeria, because the community is able to self reorganize itself, right? To support a grid that does not have the capital to make all the necessary investments. The Nigerian government just said the other day that they were gonna roll out 900,000 smart meters for free to people. We've been waiting for these smart meters forever and they keep saying these things are gonna come. However, when entities like myself get into the picture, we install those smart meters as part of our service because we know why we need them. And guess who benefits from that? The grid. Because when we collect money on time, we pay the grid money on time. And so I think they should actually be thinking about uh, ex their extension of themselves by allowing last mile distributed infrastructure companies into the game, just like last mile logistics companies it helps and it doesn't hurt their, their business case. Yeah, I would fully agree with that, Ratimi. I think um, specifically within the African context where we have low access to energy. So uh, no grid, no, no, no grid in many parts of, of Africa, that makes absolute sense. So uh, you mentioned the difference. In South Africa, we're about 90 to 95% grid connected. So access to energy is not really a, a issue. We have other issues in terms of whether uh, the utility actually gets paid and because they don't get paid, that is why we have the blackouts or you know, we're just operational inefficiencies are, uh, could be an understatement in that regard. But when I look at other countries in which where we've developed assets, it doesn't actually make sense for, for many parts of Africa to actually invest in the traditional transmission and distribution infrastructure that is required. To me, it is a bottoms up, up, up approach in areas where DNT do not exist. In, essentially there, that is where an opportunity arises for play, players like yourself to come in and actually electrify. And I, 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 I see more and more over the last five, six years that regulation is allowing for that to happen in, in these specific countries.
in, in South Africa, that would not happen because our investment has already been made in that infrastructure. It may not be the best, it may not be enhanced, but it does exist there. So um, to me, if we really want to electrify the unelectrified 600 million people that we've, we've, we've spoken about for more than a decade that, uh, that remain unelectrified in Africa, you know, the microgrid concept to me is, is the way to go. And I do believe it will be uh, not just a feel good uh, opportunity, but it could also be financially lucrative too. Yeah, of course. And I think maybe just to wrap up that point there too, it's, it's also interesting to me that, um, of course, when we think about energy equity, um, there are some parts of the Sub-Saharan African power sector that are actually over-generating, right? Um, so the East African power pool is, is facing a chronic over-generation crisis. Um, and a few of these countries have continued to procure more renewables, which then don't become substitutionary, but become additive. Um, in or excuse me, the other way around, don't become additive, but actually become substitutionary. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of curtailment um, and a lot of issues. And massively, you know, there's still still tens of millions of people within East Africa, or hundreds of millions of people within East Africa that are without power. Um, so there's there's also this question of um, in some places we are undersupplied, um, and in some places we are oversupplied. Um, and part of that question is how do we get supply to demand, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that's easier said than done in some contexts. Um, but I think, you know, thinking about smart meters in Nigeria is a really great example. And thinking about sunk costs of transmission and distribution infrastructure in places like South Africa, in contrast to building up um, sort of this bottom-up grid and thinking about how do we value those poles and wires, um, thinking about things a little bit differently as a virtual power plant. Um, I mean, there's some really interesting questions there about, you know, what are the equity benefits of thinking about things in those terms rather than purely um, thinking about them in commercial terms as well. Um, okay, so with that, we're gonna move on to audience Q&A. And just, Andrew, what you were just saying is actually a really great um, segue into the first question, which is directed at you. Um, so it asks, could you please elaborate on your experiences in Latin America and the continent's future opportunities? There seems to be a lot of different energy needs across the continent, rating, ranging from large cities on duct taped grids, to, which is a phrase that I, I like, um, to rural indigenous communities on solar. You can take that a few different ways, I think. <laughs> sure. Um, so I have worked in two Latin American countries, uh, Chile and Brazil, from an energy perspective. And, um, you know, they're very different in terms of approach. And uh, right now I'm working in the Chilean market. And um, to your point on duct tape, <laughs> I like that too. Um, it's actually... Um, one way I feel they could take learnings from other emerging markets in terms of approach on a go forward basis. And in that regard, uh, looking at alternative and innovative solutions where you are doing things from the ground up, uh, microgrids become a big play in that regard, as opposed for it to be fully uh, uh, being a government driven uh, transmission and distribution opportunity. Um, in terms of Energy, I think this year, 2020, has been quite remarkable in light of the pandemic. We've seen huge dips in, in energy demand globally uh, and in particular markets where um, pricing is actually impacted by demand. And in those markets where it is impacted by demand, we've actually seen challenges in terms of, of projects being attractive. So, um, uh, you know, to us, it's become... Um, something to think about when we actually look at uh, future investment opportunities and looking at the long-term uh, price curves out there when you have something like a pandemic. Totally unexpected, but the impact it has had in terms of energy demand is actually quite significant. How that would actually play out in future years is also going to be something very interesting to watch in terms of as people change the way and manner in which they work I think we're all sitting in our homes today. Um, and essentially, how then does that impact energy demand as we've had it in the past? So I, I actually think that the entire paradigm is actually going to change in terms of how electricity gets priced, how PPAs actually get priced for, for renewable projects like the ones we build out, specifically what we've seen in terms of the Latin American context. Great. Um, so I think maybe that's also a good segue into one of the other questions from the audience, which um, is essentially focused on COVID impacts. 
Um, so I think we could address this to all three panelists um, just to think about, you know, we all are probably tired of hearing about and talking about COVID, um, but there's no way we can avoid um, sort of asking that question or answering it. So I'd love to just hear like some of the ways that COVID has um, impacted your organizations or your business um, so far this year. And, and just Andrew, you've kind of touched on that already um, in terms of on the, on the demand side of things, but maybe from a from a Denim Capital perspective as well. Sure. Um, so at, at the moment, uh, Denim Capital doesn't have any assets in South Africa. So I'm going to talk to how it's impacted us in other ways. Um, uh, in some of our projects, it has not impacted at all um, because of the, how rural our projects have been. Uh, we've continued with construction as is. Uh, the regions in which we're constructing. We've had local crews at construction site. Uh, there's been no COVID. So, you know, it's been business as usual in terms of it. So no delay in timeline at all. In other areas where we've had to have people fly in, that has become quite a challenge in terms of actually moving development forward, uh, more so because country, country borders have been blocked. But it has also led to being quite in it, innovative in terms of solutions on how to rethink one, how one deals with a particular issue. And that has actually created what I would call resilience in terms of from an investment perspective, but also from a portfolio company perspective in terms of how they do business locally. And I think post this COVID experience, we're going to be wiser, no doubt, but we're going to come out stronger in terms of the approach that we take in terms of development, resilience, and actually protecting, creating that, that protection for businesses in terms of uh, uncertainty. And we will probably end up with, with, with companies and uh, projects that are actually gonna be uh, more sustainable on a go forward basis in that regard. There have been some delays, don't, don't get me wrong, but in many instances, we find alternative solutions to solve all that for, for some of the challenges that have arisen. Good to hear. Erica? Oof, uh, <laughs> the COVID question. Um, I mean, I would say two major things um, about COVID and kind of our world and even in construction that the, the wheels of the construction world have really just gotten gunked up and slowed down. Right, so we're still building, we're still installing solar. The demand has not changed um, in terms of, you know, communities saying we want solar in our community, we want storage in our community, we want chargers in our community. Um, but our, you know, we're primarily, we roll trucks and um, we now have to roll two trucks with our staff sitting in different trucks and those staff wearing masks and those staff then, um, you know, installing solar by attempting to stand six feet apart. And prior to COVID, we did that in a way that grid alternative staff were really the teachers. They were the four people on the job, um, making sure it was installed right and safely, but also they were the instructors providing on the job hands-on training to 10 job trainees possibly on a single site. Um, and maybe if it's a community solar array where it's multi megawatts, then hundreds of job trainees. And that, um, you know, pretty quickly ground to a halt, halt in terms of the job training component because we've basically taken all of our installation staff and created quarantine teams. Um, and those teams, if you have 10 different people coming in, you know, even for a concentrated period of time, it's a much larger group of people and the risk is much greater. Um, so, um, you know, both the job training work that we, um, you know, do every day has, you know, drastically changed. And we've had to shift a lot of that online. And then we're dealing um, in the U.S. with a digital divide as well. So, you know, many people don't have a device or they have shared devices or they have unstable Internet or they have to go to the library to get Internet and the library is closed because of COVID. Um, so it's sort of this whole 
you know, job training world that is really challenging. And then we're just building slower because not only can we not work as fast given the safety restrictions we put in place, but also everybody else, all the subcontractors pulling permits, only half the departments are open. Um, You know, some have online permits and some don't. Some have furloughed their government staff. So it's really sort of just much slower. And for us, that also then you know, because a lot of our revenue is driven by unlocking government um, incentives to help pay for the panels, then that decreases revenue. So it's been rough. <laughs> and yeah, Dr. Um, yeah, I mean, from, from our side, uh, you know, the uh, yeah, uh, first shock was we, we, we had to try and figure out how to get onto a list of essential service providers in, um, in, in Lagos. And I remember the, the team, all of us, you know, my, my CEO, Eric uh, Panico, he was here in, in Nigeria. Uh, a bunch of us were huddled around um, and just trying to figure out how do we get on that list. And so that was the first threat to us as a startup, right? Um, because you couldn't just kind of drive around, the military was out, all types of stuff. So somehow we pulled through that. And then the supply chain uh, uh, challenges started. So a lot of customers that were waiting for solutions to arrive, they kind of got very irritated by it, but they also kind of were um, understanding in that regard. And, and I think things have started to smoothen out from there. Demand is, has relatively turned, uh, started to come back to normal. We saw a lot of... Um, Communities during this period of time reevaluated the resilience of their communities, right? So all of them for the first time were exposed to living, you know, 24 hours with their dogs, their kids, their, you know, just everything, right? And they fully now were exposed to how bad the grid access issue is, right? And so we started to get a lot more phone calls from communities that just spiked and that's translated into engagements so that are going to carry us for the next year plus, right? Uh, small businesses, they just shut down, right? They just shut down for a period of time. They're starting to come back to life. Uh, larger commercial in- industries, you know, they tend to work in, you know, remote places. So I think that, you know, if you were negotiating a PPA, it's 10 years, 15 years, you keep negotiating your PPA. I think they, they kind of um, moved forward. Um, and I think that's the way it's kind of played out. What we did do is we became a fully remote organization within a few months. So you know, we, our rent was coming up um, for the, the office. We shut it down and we have not uh, gone back to it. And it, it, what it did for us is it accelerated our, our focus on becoming a fully virtualized grid, right? And so we now see that there's even a greater need for a more efficient um, network of backup power, uh, storage, um, um, uh, solar, electricity, so on and so forth that can be shared because not everyone's going to need it at the same time. So that's how it's affected us from maybe the grassroots kind of level. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, all right, so we are just about out of time. So I'm going to ask one final question um, as sort of a lightning round. Um, so this question is addressed to all three of you. And it says, looking at the role of government, what policies do you think are the most important for su- supporting sustainable energy development, either in the U.S. or abroad, particularly given that some of the clean energy policies that have succeeded in the U.S. don't focus on those communities that need the benefits of sustainable development the most? Uh, Erica, it sounds like you should start with that one. I couldn't click my mute button. Uh, We actually published a policy guide um, that really sort of addresses that question with nuance. Um, It's www.lowincomesolar.org and talks about affordable housing, community solar, single family, workforce, storage, um, all of those things. I think my tagline for the policy is, uh, you know, equity, not access um, and uh, co-benefits. Great, thanks. Fatimi? We need uh, our net metering policy out here to just come to life. If we had net metering in, in Nigeria, wow, like this would be the most, probably the most advanced grid in the world. So that's something that we are looking for. We need lower financing as well. Um, some of the, the good stuff that you guys have access to production tax credits, investment tax credits, lower cost of capital. I think if all of those things kind of come together, plus net metering, um, um, it will be phenomenal, but we're going to create it anyway. So, 
Yeah. Oh, I'd have to make a big difference. Yeah. I'd have to agree with. I would have to agree with Rotimi if we could have all of those good things that came out of the U.S. in um, it's from 2008 to probably uh, yeah, uh, that decade, uh, ten years thereafter. I think would be really beneficial in terms of uh, uh, rolling out and providing access to low-cost clean energy across many, many emerging markets, not just Africa. Great. All right, I think we are just about out of time. So I think we'll leave it there and I will hand it back over to Megan. Thank you all so much for your insights. And to our audience, thank you very much for your attention and your great questions um, and appreciate your participation. Megan. All right, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to each of our speakers here today. So such a fascinating conversation on how energy enables development in a variety of ways across the globe. And I appreciate each of you sharing your unique perspective and expertise.